you believe you serve a wonderful and amazing God today? Let me hear you say amen. God is awesome. Thank you so much, praise team, for that. Thank you so much, uh, Pine Forge Academy Choir, for coming, for blessing us today. Uh, I, I actually... Uh, I'm thankful to be reunited with uh, Jared Roseboro. Jared and I worked together for a long time at Decatur Church, my previous church. He was our praise and worship leader for several years. And about a year before I left, he left to go to uh, Pine Forge Academy. You're doing an excellent job. We're very proud of you. Let's give uh, Elder Roseboro, we should call him Dr. Roseboro. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you for bringing them, for using your talents today. I actually owe a lot to Pine Forge Academy. Uh, my wife graduated from there. Um, I'm sure, sure some of her good qualities came from Pine Forge Academy. And so uh, I thank them for what they did to prepare her for a life with me. <laughs> I see Elder Wright and his wife here today. Glad you're here today joining us. Um, Van and Kim, uh, Van Dion Griffin is the Associate Youth and Young Adult Director for the North American Division. They are here today. I believe their daughter is in the choir up there. There she is right there. Good to see you. Oh, that's Myron's daughter too. Hey, how you doing? And Danielle's. Wow. Okay, so a bunch of my uh, friends that I went to school with, their kids are in the choir. That makes me very old. So uh, glad you're here, but you are a representative of my ancientness. Uh, glad you guys are here today too. We believe God is going to bless us. Uh, ushers, do you have the cards with you? Do you have them? I want the ushers, if they would pass them out right now, if you would. Uh, on the last uh, couple of Sabbaths, last Sabbath we did it uh, also. Ushers, do you have them? Do you have the missing persons card, missing members cards? Good. Could you pass them out right now? Uh, we are going to be doing uh, a spring revival at the end of this month. The last uh, Sunday, which is uh, March the 24th through Friday, March the 29th. We'll be in the Keystone Room for that entire week, every night at 7 p.m. Um, we're going to be there, I guess we'll be here Sabbath morning as well, on the 30th. And um, our particular focus this time around is going to be missing members. And I want, I want to tell you what I think a missing member is so that you will know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a person who was a member of this church who transferred to another church. And I'm not talking about someone who moved away. I'm talking about a person that you know of that used to be here, who is no longer here and probably isn't at any other church. Somebody who fell away. Someone that you may pray for regularly. Maybe this person is in your family. Maybe this person is one of your friends. Maybe you used to sit beside them at church and you haven't seen them in months, even years. Uh, those are the people that we want to reach out to and try to reclaim during this one week of spring revival at the end of this month. And so what I gave to you just now uh, is a missing members card. If you think of a person, I'm giving it to you now because um, our message today is focused on this as well. And so at the end of today's sermon, if you haven't thought of a person already, I want you to take some time, pray over that, person, uh, that person's name down. We're going to pray over those people today at the end of our message. These are the cards that I received back already from first service today. And so we're excited about it. We believe God is going to bless. So think about that person and have that person on your heart today as we examine this message together. The title is Carry Them to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God that has been preserved for our edification. We recognize that every Sabbath that we come to church and we get to hear the Word of God, it is a privilege to hear it. But we also recognize that with the Word of God sometimes comes a challenge. Challenge our hearts today by the power of your Son, Jesus Christ, and may we fulfill that challenge by the power of the Holy Spirit. Give them to us today in their fullness. May Jesus Christ be lifted up. May he be seen. May he be known. May he be heard. And may someone give his or her life to him at the end of this message. 
In his name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 2. What book did I say? Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1 and reading to verse 12. I wonder if we can read it together. I have it for you on the screen, I believe. Yes, it is there. And if you are ready, we can read this together. We'll begin. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And then some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to a paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you? Or say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Who says amen to God's word today? Amen. Carry them to Jesus. His ministry is still in its early stages. He only has four disciples to date. Two sets of brothers, all four fishermen. Simon Peter and Andrew, James and John. But though his earthly ministry has been short-lived, according to Mark, Jesus has been very busy. In chapter 1, Jesus gets baptized in verse 9. He's tempted by Satan in verse 12. He calls four men to follow him in verse 19. He casts out a demon in church in verse 25. He heals Peter's mother-in-law in verse 31. He cures an entire city of ailments and demon possession in verse 33. He preached in Galilee in verse 39 and cured a leper in verse 41. All of this in just 45 verses. Christ is serious about his mission to the world, and he will stop at nothing until the news of his salvation is made mi manifest mightily everywhere that he goes. So now we're in chapter 2. It's Christ's second trip to Capernaum in this short period of time. The town benefited greatly from his last visit, so you can imagine their excitement once the news of his return began to circulate. Jesus is back and his reputation goes before him. And the people of Capernaum will not be deterred. They track him down and locate his whereabouts like a GPS. And then they converge on his position in this small house where he is preaching. They are packed into a confined space. This small dwelling hanging on Christ's every word. And they're hoping to hear a word that will lift their burdens and transform their darkness into light. And Jesus does not disappoint them. The news of Christ's return reaches the group of four men also. They're excited because they have a friend who has been paralyzed for many years. They determine together that if they could only get their friend to Jesus, he may have a chance to be healed. So the four men pick up their crippled comrade and carry him in the direction of the house where Jesus is preaching. 
But when they approach the edifice, they are not encouraged by what they see. There are so many people crowded in that house that they cannot get inside to get their friend to Christ. Now, what will they do? Mark's story is a fitting metaphor for our work as Christians as we strive to do God's work on this earth. Jesus has instructed all true believers of him to be about his father's business. This means we all have to have a burden for souls and a desire to see people saved into the kingdom. In other words, we have an obligation to get people to Jesus even if we have to carry them there ourselves. And this episode in Mark chapter 2 gives us the formula for doing just that. I want to point out three interesting details. How many interesting details? Three interesting details about this passage that inform us about our burden for souls and what that should really look like, beginning in verse 3. Look what the Bible says, Mark chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by how many men? Four men. The first thing we learn from this fearsome foursome is our individual faithfulness is of the utmost importance. Repeat after me. Every member is individually important to the whole. If you believe that, say amen. Now, I don't want to confuse you here. I'm not preaching the popular philosophy of individualism. It is my firm belief that God created us to be a community of believers who work together for the good of others. I'm not preaching selfishness or individualism today. But I am saying, though, that we are all part of the body. And each one of us has been gifted by God with a specific strength that is meant to benefit the whole. And if any one of us is not doing the job for which we were created, the body of Christ suffers. Just think with me for a minute. There are four men who carry their comrade to Jesus, right? It was likely that it was a mat. The King James says a bed, but one commentator says that the beds in those days were mats. And thus, the paralytic's friends may have carried him on a bed which he lay on all the time. And I imagine this mat is like a stretcher so that each of the men in the story must carry his own weight in order to successfully get this paralyzed man to Jesus. If any one of the four men decided to shirk their responsibility, the helpless man on the stretcher would have fallen off of his method of transport. All four men are necessary to act as a team in order for this one man to be successfully transferred from his place of abode to the home where Jesus is preaching. But what kind of team would they be if each one of them did not have individual faithfulness? I can still remember playing on the basketball team at South Lancaster Academy, the, college, the, the, the high school that I attended uh, in Massachusetts when my dad used to pastor at AUC. And I remember it was my sophomore year, we are playing against an in-town rival, a team that we played often, a team that we knew sort of like the back of our hand, and we had beat them so many times, we beat them most of the time when we play, and we knew we pretty much had this game in the bag. So we really didn't come with all of the effort that we normally play with. So at halftime, we were, done, we were down by 10 or 15 points. I can't remember what it was. Whatever the deficit was, it should not have been so because we were obviously better than them. And I remember the coach got upset with us at halftime. He said some words to us loudly. And then he did something that he's never done before. He took all five of the starters out of the game. He said, you're not going to start the second half. And we assumed he was going to put in the second string team, but he didn't do that either. He put in the third string guys, the guys that basically almost never got in the game, the guys that basically only got to practice usually. Those are the five he started the second half with. And guess what happened? They came out and they played with so much effort. They dove for every loose ball. They boxed out for every rebound. 
They went back on defense after every shot, no matter what. They hustled their brains out. And by the time he put us back in the game, about 10 minutes later, we were actually winning. What did we learn on that day? Here's what I learned. I learned that it doesn't really matter how talented I am if when I get out there, I don't have individual faithfulness. And my faithfulness was not to get stats padded or to get my name in the newspaper. My faithfulness was because if I didn't do my job, my team would suffer. That's what the coach was trying to teach us that day. So we took all five of us out. He said, I'll put in people who are less talented if they're willing to be faithful. Do you understand that God is just looking for some faithful people today? Do you know that? He doesn't need talented people. He can give you talent on the back end. In fact, sometimes God calls us and then he equips us. When we respond to him in individual faithfulness, that's what God can use. Who says amen to that today? It's the same way with us in this church. Our effectiveness as a church family to bring people to Christ is contingent upon our being faithful to the individual tasks that God has given to us. God has gifted us as a church, amen? We have some special people in our church family, and we have special skill sets as well. He wants us to be faithful to him by using what he's given us already for the kingdom of God and for his glory. We are a team. But we must all carry our own weight. If we don't, the people we attempt to bring to Jesus will fall off of their proverbial mats. God can give us individual faithfulness. Who says amen to that today? Here's the second thing in verse 4. Mark chapter 2 and verse 4. Look what the Bible says. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed which the paralytic was lying. Here's the second thing that we learn from this cooperative quartet. It has to do with the importance of our attitude. Here it is. The men displayed care, creativity, and what, everybody? And courage. In order for them to complete their mission of bringing their friend to Christ, they needed these three C's. What are the three C's? Care, creativity, and what? And courage. If you believe that, say amen today. We too must be caring, creative, and courageous if we want to successfully bring people to Jesus, especially if we're trying to get people back who used to be here before. Let me just pause for a second to say this. Everyone, how many people? Everyone that leaves the church left for a reason. And maybe the reason had to do with the way they felt treated while they were here the first time. So it's important that if we're going to try to win them back, we have to be caring, creative, and courageous. Who says amen to that today? These four men had these things. They cared enough about this man in order to bring him to the master for healing. And when they saw the obstacles in their their way, they did not stop. They kept going because they cared about their friend. Beloved, this should be our attitude as well. When we minister to those around us, we must care enough for them that we be willing to do things for them that they might not be able to do for themselves. But also, if we don't care about them, it will come out in the first obstacle that comes our way. If it's really about us and the credit that we might get, then we'll look for excuses not to move forward or to go all the way. At the sign of the first hint of hardship, we'll say, I gave it my best try, but I guess it wasn't meant to be. That's not real care for people. These men cared about their friend, and they would not be easily deterred. But the men were creative, too. When they got to the house, they noticed a large throng of people in front of and around the door, preventing them from bringing the mat in through the normal convenient entrance. So they got creative and decided to use a less orthodox means of access. Houses in the first century Palestine had accessible roofs. One commentator says the roof was approached by an outside staircase so they could reach it unimpeded. They walked up the steps with their friends and then thought up a new and risky plan. 
The roof of a single-story home in first century Palestine was normally sturdy enough to walk on, but was actually made out of branches and brushes laid over roof beams and covered with dried mud. Thus, you could dig through it. So they dug through the roof, and they let the man down on this makeshift first century elevator engineered out of rope. They had to get creative to do something that was unconventional in order to get their boy close enough to Jesus to be noticed. There's something that's remarkable to me. The Bible doesn't say anything about the four men letting themselves down afterwards. Now, if you're that close to Jesus, if I'm that close to Jesus, I'm going to let my friend down, then I'm going to get myself down too so I can get an autograph as well. These men were caring and creative about their friend and getting him to Jesus. He was the objective on that day. So much so that they themselves didn't benefit from a face-to-face encounter with him. Beloved, that's exactly what we're called to do sometimes. We must be concerned enough about others' salvation to look past the obstacles that are in our way so that we can get people to Jesus. It will sometimes mean that we have to get creative. It will sometimes mean that we have to think outside the box. It will sometimes mean that we'll have to be inconvenienced. Here's the sad reality. I hate saying this, but I have to tell you. The reality is when you poll most people and you ask them why they're not more involved in ministry, nine times out of ten, their reason has to do with it's just not convenient. And I'm not, I'm not immune from this problem either. Happened earlier this week. Earlier this week, somebody came to the church for help. I was at the office, and Hyacinth was at the office. A few others were there. And the gentleman came. Hyacinth met him, and they exchanged some words. He told her what he was looking for, what he was trying to do. His English wasn't that great. And so she tried to help him the best that he could, that she could. Uh, what he wanted, we didn't actually have. But, but there were other entities in our area that we know of that have what he wanted. And so she tried to give him the, the card. You remember those cards that Pastor Shisto had made that say all of the services in this area that are available, Adventist Community Services and so many others. It's written on back and front. It looks like a little business card. In fact, at the end of service today, you can pick up some in the foyer and take some home with you. If you see somebody that needs help, you don't have to tell them you can't help them. You can say, here's some places where you can go. Well, that's what she tried to do. And uh, this particular gentleman had trouble with his vision in his left eye, and his English wasn't that great. And so he really couldn't see the card that well. And so uh, Hyacinth needed some help. So she sent me an email. I came from my office in the back, came and met the gentleman that was right there. And when he uh, talked about what his issue was, I, I really spoke slowly, and I told him where he could go. I told him how close it was. I even told him how to take the bus over there. And I, I, I got a piece of paper, and I wrote the directions down in big letters so that he could read it. And then while I was escorting him to the door, I was about to send him on his way, the Holy Spirit said, you should be taking him to the Adventist Community Center. So at, the, at that moment, I said to myself, well, I'm really busy. I got a lot of stuff going on. Now, I wish I, wish I could say that immediately I said to the Holy Spirit, yes, that's what I'm going to do. That wasn't my immediate response. I didn't say it out loud, but I said it in my heart. But I obeyed the Spirit. I went and got my coat, went and got my keys. I said, man, let me take you over there. Just for the record, so that you know, it takes all of seven minutes to drive from here to the Adventist Community Center. When I got to the center, Daphne was there at her post. She gave me a hug. She said, Pastor, we have somebody who can help him. He speaks his language. I'll get him. He said, you can go back. I I, I stayed around for about five minutes or so to make sure he was all set. And then took me another seven minutes to get home. Uh, The entire trip, I was back in my office in 20 minutes. We can't take 20 minutes to be inconvenienced to help out a servant of God, a child of God. I wish I could admit that I was immune. I'm not either. 
Nine times out of ten. That's why people don't do it. We don't care enough. We don't want to get creative. If we do, it's too much to do. Oh, I can't do all that. That's too much. If we're going to be successful in this effort, we've got to be caring and creative. Who says amen to that today? But we've got to have courage as well. Thinking up this new creative plan is one thing, but having the courage to carry that thing out is an entirely different thing. Think about the things that could have gone wrong here in this story in Mark. What if they dropped their friend off the mat while they were attempting to lower him down? What if while they were carrying him up the steps on the way to the roof, they dropped him? That man could have died. What if Jesus rejected them because of their apparent rudeness? That would have been really embarrassing. What if their plan was an utter failure? Without courage, none of the stuff they came up with meant anything. Now, do you know, do you know that it takes courage for us to reach out and try to get people back to Jesus Christ? We need courage. It doesn't mean you're not going to be afraid. It means you're going to do it anyway, even though you are afraid. That's what courage is. Just like the four men in the story. There will be obstacles in our path, many things meant to deter us from going all out for others. But if we are persistent with all perseverance and patience, God will open our eyes to creative ways to get people to him. But it will demand courage and caring as well. Who says amen to that today? Here's our last one. Mark chapter 2 and verse 5. Last point. When Jesus saw whose faith? Whose faith? Their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Here's the final thing that we learned from this gallant group about the importance of belief. God honored their faith to the benefit of the paralyzed man. Repeat after me. We must have faith if we want God to work for others. You believe that? Say amen today. Notice with me that the Bible never even once mentions a request from the paralyzed man to be carried to Jesus. doesn't mention that, and I think it's deliberate. Did we ever read that the man on the stretcher was even interested in being healed? It's not even in the story. Now, now, we make the assumption that a man who spent so much of his life as a paralytic would want to be healed, right? But the Bible doesn't say that he asked or even wanted to. But don't you find it funny... That in such a story, there was no mention even of the faith of the crippled man. I can think of many other miracles of Jesus where the person being healed gets the credit for having great faith. I can even remember times where the recipient of the cure is credited for puny, mustard seed size faith. But I can't remember too many times in the Bible where Jesus heals a person on the merits of somebody else's faith. For this reason, we sit up and we take notice of this passage. Mark is highlighting an important feature within the body of Christ. When we display faith in God's ability to act in the lives of others, God often honors our faith in mighty ways, and he will even bless others for our sake. Sometimes the person might not even be asking for the blessing. So I have a cousin, a cousin who's in the church now, but who did not start off in the church, and neither did his father. Uh, my cousin's mother is my aunt, and I remember she would pray for her husband and her son their whole lives, basically. So basically, she was the only real one in the house that was uh, believing when they first got married. Uh, she married a man who was not in the church and really wasn't even necessarily a believer. And when they had children... She raised the children to be in the church. They went to Adventist school, all of that. But when they got older, the older child decided to stay in the church, and the younger child followed his father and went out of the church. That's my cousin. One night at like 2 o'clock in the morning, my cousin called me, having had this crazy experience while he was out doing something. And he felt like he heard the voice of God say to him, you need to stop playing around and come back to me. It scared him so much, he called his pastor cousin and said, hey man, I had this experience. Dude, I got to get my life together. I'm tired of doing this. I need you to give me Bible studies. I said, okay. And we started that week. 
on the phone. We started doing Bible studies. By the time that thing was over, he said, you know what, man? I want to get baptized. I said, okay. He said, I want to come down. I want to fly down to your church. I, I was in Greenville, South Carolina. He was living in New York at the time. He flew down to my church. We arranged everything, and we came. We baptized him that day. But his parents came to the baptism, his mother and his unbelieving father. And I remember as I stood there with my hand up, saying the thing I say before I put the person down on the water, I remember looking at my uncle's face, and he had this, this tear in his eye. It seemed like something got a hold of him. After he watched his son go down into the watery grave and come back up in newness of life, about a week later, he called my grandfather. My uncle called my grandfather and said, I need you to give me Bible studies. A few months later, he got baptized, and now they're both very active in their church. Why am I telling you that story? Because my aunt had a quality that most mothers and wives do not have. My aunt did not cajole them. She did not nag them. She didn't beg them to come to church. She got up every Sabbath morning and went to church and prayed for her men that they would one day accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I still believe to this day, while they weren't even thinking about God, God was blessing them on her behalf because her faith was great, because she stayed on her knees, because she never gave up on them. That's a real world example of a person benefiting and they didn't even ask for it. This is what I believe God is trying to teach us. If we decide that we're going to bring people back to Jesus, we don't actually even ever have to physically pick them up. All we have to do is bring them to Jesus on our knees in our intercessory prayer. Do you know that sometimes God gives you the gift of discernment so that you can see what's going on in the life of somebody else? Not so you can talk about them. Not so you can feel better than them because they have this problem that you don't have. The reason God does that is so that you can take their issue on your knees to God and pray for somebody else who may not even be praying for themselves. And God says, sometimes I'll bless them because of your faith. We have the power to do that in this church. Who says amen to that today? I believe God wants to use us to do it. All we have to do is be diligent in our intercessory prayer, interceding for others as we perform the same task as those four men did that day for their friend who was a paralytic. We must have faith in God. And he can work for others. We can carry them to Jesus. So that's it. Those are the three ingredients. We must be individually faithful. We must remember those three C's, care, creativity and courage and we must have faith that God can work for others on our behalf if you want to start carrying people to Jesus raise your hand right now if you know that you have for you to carry them yourself raise your other hand <laughs> now look up and say I surrender praise the Lord have you ever read that poem there's a poem entitled footprints in the sand you ever read that I don't know it verbatim, but here's how it basically goes. There's a man who is having a dream, and in the dream, his life flashes before his eyes. He can remember all these things that happened in his life, and the representation of that are footprints in the sand, and he notices two sets of footprints all the time. Then it says the last scene of his life flashes, and when he looks back, he notices that during the difficult times of life, when things were really hard, when he was really struggling, when he had nowhere to turn to, instead of two sets of footprints, he only saw one. And he started to get upset. And he said, God, you told me that if I put my trust in you, that if I gave you my life, that you would never leave me nor forsake me. How come in the most troubling times of my life, I only see one set of footprints? Where were you? God turns to the man and says, son, during those times, you weren't strong enough even to walk. Those are the times that I carried you. That's why there's one set of footprints. It was me walking, not even you. Beloved, I need you to know right now that the reason why we carry people to Jesus is because Jesus is constantly carrying us. So many times we think we're walking on our own, we don't even realize we wouldn't have the strength to make it another day if it weren't for Jesus and his faithfulness to us. 
He sends his angels to give charge over you and you don't even know he's doing it. He sends his Holy Spirit to give you power in situations where you'd be failing. God is there to, to comfort you, to lift you up, even in the times when you think he's not there. That's when he's there the most, carrying you. And because Jesus carries me, I want to carry somebody else. Carry them back to Jesus. So now is the time to do just that. Would you take that paper? A little missing member card that you got at the beginning. Would you take one right now and jot down a person's name? And whatever information about that person you have, if you have their contact information, their phone number, their email, whatever, so that we can find a way to contact them. And by the way, the way this works best is that if you have a relationship with them, you should invite them too. Invite them to come to our revival. By the way, you may find that this person isn't motivated enough to drive themselves, or maybe they don't have a mode of transportation. And maybe you're going to find that the person lives in the opposite direction of church, away from your home. Maybe consider inconveniencing yourself for that week, picking them up and bringing them to the revival. Seems like a small thing. But it might be the thing that saves their lives eternally. Are you willing to carry people to Jesus? Father, you have issued to us a challenge, a challenge that we know right now is difficult for us to be able to pursue, but we know by your power this challenge can be met through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so now, God, as we think about those names, some of them we've already written down. Right now, we just want to pray over those people. The names we collected at first service. The names we're about to collect right now. The names of people that we don't even know to write down. People that you are chasing after at this moment. God, use us to bring them back to you. Give us the words to say. Give us the opportunity to show Jesus Christ so they will reclaim their trust in you. There was a time they believed. There was a time they thought you could do what you said. And something happened to make them disillusioned. Maybe it was us. Father, give us the courage. Give us the creativity. Give us the care to go after them. Same way you came after us. God, if we just stopped and thought for a moment, we'd remember that we weren't always saved ourselves. There was a time we were out there doing something else. And you used a person to bring us to you. God, may that person be me. May that person be one of those who are sitting in this congregation today. While your heads are still bowed and your eyes are still closed, there might be somebody else in the house of God today who wants to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Maybe you want to come to Jesus for the first time. Maybe you want to come back to him after having left him. Maybe you want to just join this family, this particular Sabbath-keeping family here at Tacoma Park. I don't know who you are, but you're in the house today. I want to invite you to raise your hand right now where you are. I'll see you, and I pray a special prayer for you today in the balcony, on the main floor. I see you. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hands over here. God bless you. I see you. I see you in the balcony. God bless you. Somebody else today, I see you. God bless you. God bless you. I see your hands. Just raise them high. I'll see them. And I'll pray a special prayer for you today. God bless you. Somebody else today. Somebody else. I see you in the back. God bless you. I see you in the balcony. God bless you. In the back. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you down here in the front. I see you too. Yes. Father, I thank you. Thank you for the hands that were raised today. And I ask God that you would seal their decision right now in Jesus Christ. That you would allow them to never go back to their old ways. God, I don't know what they were deciding when they raised their hand. Maybe they're coming back to you. Maybe they're accepting you for the first time. Maybe they just want to join this body of believers. 
whoever they are, God, you know their situation and you know their journey. Give them exactly what they need right now. Give them the power and the courage and the strength to always follow you. God, we know your coming is soon. We're asking that they would be saved into your kingdom. Give them an extra set of angels today to walk beside them. Beat back the devil. Help them to know that they can make it in this life. And that even if the devil takes them out, it was your plan because he can only do what you give him permission to do. And God, you know what's best for us. Give them what they need as well as the rest of us. And we'll praise you for as long as eternity rolls in a world that will never end. We know your coming is soon. Help us to be ready. In the worthy name of Jesus, let everybody who loves God say together, amen and amen. God bless you. If you would take those cards right now and pass them to the end of your row, can you do that? Whatever card you filled out, pass it to the end of your row so that the ushers can collect them on the way out today. And we'll be able to take them and pray over those names and contact those people as we carry people to Jesus. May God bless you.